You are groundbreaking. I've never met somebody. I don't think this. I mean, literally walking around with a sledgehammer in front of you, constantly breaking some new barrier down. Let's start by telling listeners that it's an incredible story. What happened to you? And to all of you new listeners, please pay very careful attention to what happened to Nikki Goser a few years ago. And then we're going to dig deep into it over these next two segments. Because, again, she's changed the rules of the game, the, the way they're played. Nikki, what happened? Back in 2009, my husband, Ben, was murdered right in front of me by a man who was stalking me. This happened in a restaurant that was a, a gun-free zone at the time. And I followed that gun control law. I left my legal permitted handgun that I normally carried for self-defense, walked inside of my vehicle that night. Of course, the man who was stalking me did not have a permit to carry. He brought a gun in illegally into the restaurant where Ben and I were. And when I asked management to please remove him uh, because I knew I was being stalked, um, when they confronted him and asked him to leave, he pulled a 45 and shot my husband in the head. He then stood over Ben and continued to fire six more rounds into him. I will probably wonder for the rest of my life if I could have prevented that. Of course, I'll never know. Um, I was stalked and defenseless. So I, for the past 12 years, I've tried to talk to people about the dangers of gun-free zones and how they leave good people vulnerable and bad people with evil intentions, I think, are actually um, emboldened to, to go there and harm people. They know they can't defend themselves there. Yeah. And um, this man has actually stalked me from prison as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's been sending twisted love letters. And he's now charged uh, federally uh, with felony stalking so um while he's behind bars I, that, he's behind bars first off let me say this nikki wrote a book about the about her ordeal it's a true story stalked the defenseless how gun control helped my stalker murder my husband in front of me by nikki gozer nikki there's video of that event from that from that uh location isn't there from the from the restaurant yeah. okay and yeah, i the i've seen still shots did any of that yeah. get out? Not the complete video, no. No, okay. they don't allow that. They don't want, you know. Yeah. Obviously, that would hurt victims. and But part of it is, is there. Um, they stop it right before the gun is fired. So you uh, don't see that. Yeah, I've seen the still shots, and it's harrowing. More so than anything, because I know you. And uh, you and I met right after this happened. And I think I, I always am reminded of the time that you and I were on the Stossel Show panel together. And I'll let you tell that story because we sat with one of who I believe to be, I mean, a hero and a great American. Tell listeners about that day we sat on that panel at the Stossel Show. We were in New oh, York gosh, and Fox News. So long ago. <laughs> well, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, it was interesting. I think that was my first time um on on a major show like that it was a little bit intimidating um but everybody was really nice and Susanna Hupp was there of course your listeners are probably familiar with her she survived the Luby's cafeteria massacre in Colleen Texas where her parents were um murdered by a madman who drove his truck through the window yeah. and started shooting people um but yeah, that was back. It was back in ninety one when she when that happened to her, as she was sitting there yeah. at, at a table with a friend and her mom and yeah. dad when that occurred. And it, what what happened, listeners? When because the the it was the three of us on the panel. It was it was me sitting close to closest to Stossel, Susanna sitting in the middle, and then Nikki was sitting on the end of the panel. And it was a live studio audience on Fox as we were filming that episode. And Stossel asked Susanna Hupp a question that every time I hear you tell this story, I think about that. Because you answer that question, you make a statement that pretty much is right in line with what Susanna Hupp said. And I'll use this to take us to the break. And we come back. 
I'll start going into what Nikki's done since this occurred. But Stossel asks Susanna Hupp, what would have happened or could you have changed what happened that day had you had your gun? Now, she was one of seven people who had guns left in the vehicle following Texas law that day. And her response was very telling and almost haunting. She said, I don't know. I'll never know. But I do know this. If I had had my gun on me, it would have changed the odds. It would have changed the odds. And you just heard Nikki say, I'll probably spend the rest of my life wondering. And Nikki, you will spend the rest of your life wondering, sadly. But as Susanna Hupp said, and we all agreed that day, it would have changed the odds. Wow, powerful stuff. When we come back, we'll talk about what's changed in Tennessee as a result of Nikki Goser's story. Back right after this. Don't go away. The following segment of Armed American Radio is being brought to you by Defender Coffee. When you drink Defender Coffee, you're making a donation to a gun rights organization of your choice that protects and defends your freedoms. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back inside Armed American Radio's Daily Defense, gunbroker.com studios. You just heard it. Defender Coffee. It's the first thing I did this morning was got up. And by the way, I had more done today by 930 than most people probably had done by or are still doing in the day today. Very productive. I happened to get up really early today. But I got a lot done, and it was for you because we were putting together. I was putting together on what my responsible part of the marketing campaign that we're doing with Daniel Defense, and I was excited about it. I had a good night's sleep, got up early. First thing I did was grab a Defender coffee, big extra double cup, put a little bit of uh, dry creamer in it, a little bit of sweetener in it. Boom! I was off starting my day. I just I can't do black coffee. I just can't. It's too bitter for me. I like a little cream in it. But Defender coffee, and when I did that. I supported the Second Amendment Foundation. See, you wake up, drink coffee, support the Second Amendment Foundation. It's a no-brainer. DefenderCoffee.com, you can do that as well. The promo code is AAR. Take discounts off the coffee. Have it shipped to you every month like I do. Set up your own schedule, and Derek and the crew will send you some of the best coffee you've ever had in your life. So you drink coffee and support the gun rights organization of your choice with the profits. It's, it's just a no-brainer. We'll talk more about the rest of our partners, but suffice to say, all of it presented to you by X Insurance. And our newest partner, Daniel Defense. And here we are on the Crossbreed Holsters microphone. Let's go back to Nikki Goser. Nikki, the uh, the story about, you know, that when you said, I'll probably wonder, and I'm going to throw the retort back, you will. Probably, you will. You're going to. And, and you agreed. I think the three of us agreed on the panel with Susanna that day. Because, you see, I was on that panel because I had a gun. And it did change the odds. The attack against me stopped dead in its tracks because I pointed a gun at two people and they were smart enough not to advance any further. And it does change the odds. And I know it changes the odds. Do you want to comment on that a little bit before we start talking about the efforts, your efforts in, in the like your legislative efforts, et cetera, in Tennessee? Um, I mean, you know, I think as a victim of a horrible crime like that, you can't help but wonder um, if things could have been different. And I have done that, you know, in the past, I guess now 12 years later, I've kind of gotten to the point where I know I can't dwell on that because I don't think it's healthy for me mentally yeah. and emotionally. I can't change anything now as far as that situation. But what I did do was I worked with the sponsor of the restaurant carry bill here in Tennessee after this happened to Ben and I, um, Senator Doug Jackson. Um, at the time, sponsored it in the in the Senate, and he actually invited me to come to the Senate floor, and he told my story to the senators, and um, they ended up passing the restaurant carry bill. So now in Tennessee, as long as you've got your handgun carry permit, um, you can carry in restaurants that serve alcohol as long as you are not drinking any alcohol. And um, they're still allowed to post a no gun sign if that, mm -hmm. you know, private business owner wants to, but at least it's no longer state law. Um, so that was positive. Um, well, let me, let me stop also, you for a second. When you were going through that process, did you run into any pushback from Democrats? On the restaurant here, Bill? Yeah. Sure, there were some, yeah. Now, I see, I have to ask the question. When, when I hear your story, what human being would push back against you 
after what you had just gone through as a law-abiding citizen? I have to ask that question because I can't wrap my head around that, okay? Yeah, they didn't actually push back against me, per se. Um, they wouldn't address me. Yeah, imagine um, that. But they had, you know, reasons for not supporting it. But surprisingly, the sponsor, Senator Jackson, he he was a Democrat, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a very pro-gun Democrat. He was a very nice man. And that's great to hear. That's great to hear. It's too bad it's not like that across the board. I, I don't understand it, but... Regardless, I, I, I think about that and I wonder what, what person wouldn't provide another human being, human being the opportunity to be able to defend themselves in a situation like that when they have to know that a scumbag like this is not going to follow the law. It, it just is mind boggling to me. Nonetheless, so that passed. And now it, in Tennessee, I know that the no gun sign, though, does carry the weight of law in Tennessee. If I walk past it intentionally and I'm found to be carrying a gun in violation of that, I can be charged with a crime. Is that true? Or is it just a trespassing? Get out of here. Um, it's, I believe it's just the trespassing. Okay, good. Now. That's good to know. That's good to know because that was a change. That's excellent. All right. But now more has happened because tell listeners and you alluded to it, this guy has just not given up. Tell us about the sentence he got. And what he's been doing, what you found out he's been doing behind bars from your attorney. Yeah. So he got 23 years um, at 100% with no parole. But that was a lie. Victims are lied to every day in court. He's been allowed to earn early release good behavior credit. And he's already earned the max, which is three and a half years early release. Um, we don't really have truth in sentencing here in Tennessee. Hopefully that will change, but um, it, it was premeditated, mm -hmm. but he used the um, insanity defense. That didn't work, but they brought up, you know, delusional disorder. The mental health experts diagnosed him with delusional disorder with erotomania, and um, he was convicted of second degree, the lesser offense. But, um, yeah, I found out he's been writing me twisted love letters from prison for years. And what he did was he sent them to my former attorney that handled my wrongful death suit against him. Of course, the court paperwork is sent to him in prison and it had my attorney's address on it. And so that's how he had the address. And he would send these letters, obviously, to me. I mean, they had my name on them. Um, he'd send them to my attorney's office. And um, the first two letters came before the actual murder trial. And I tried to get the prosecutor to help me get extra charges, get a restraining order. I needed it to stop. And nobody really helped me. So what do you do when nobody's helping you? I told my attorney, look, just don't tell me anymore. I cannot handle this. Please just don't tell me. So he honored that request from a very distraught widow. And he did not tell me for years okay. until late 2019. All right. I, you know, my, my first question, and, and I, I ask this, and listeners, I've known Nikki a long time. Nikki has broke bread at my house. She has spent weekend here. Her, her little dog was here. Uh, we're friends. We've known each other a long time. Two, two things I want to point out. When you go back 12 years and you say, okay, 20, 23 years, that's a long time. Well, guess what? It's now eight years with good time. Seven. Seven years now with his good time. That 23 years doesn't take long. And then when you're getting time cut off of it, seven years is going to go by like this, just like that. And this clown yeah. is going to be out. So that's the first thing. You wonder why this man was not given life when because he was caught. He had duct tape. He had rope. What else did he have? When the police searched his vehicle at the crime scene, they found two more guns, ammunition, a baseball bat, binoculars, gloves, rope, and a knife. Police made note that he made a number of physical preparations that very day. He purchased the shoulder holster he used, the binoculars, and the baseball bat that day. This is premeditation, bar none. Yes. He should have been convicted and, sent, in my estimation, sentenced to death. He should be dead now. He should have either been swinging on the end of a rope in the public square, he should have been fried in the chair, or he should have been laid out on a gurney, and everybody there, including Nikki, able to watch him take his last scumbag breath. That's my, that's my personal opinion. I don't have time for people like this. 
They shouldn't be walking this earth. And he's not. And not only is he walking, he can walk out. So when we come back from this break, we're going to tell you what Nikki, what Nikki just is the first of its kind. A judge just signed an order, the first of its kind. Uh, again, breaking new ground. The legislation in Tennessee passed in large measure because of Nikki Gozer and our guest. And what you're going to hear next, she's the first person in Tennessee to have a judge do this. We'll tell that, too. And I want to throw a shout out while we're here. Dusty Hill, uh, if you're a rock and roll fan, Dusty Hill, 72 years old, the bassist for ZZ Top died today. So but just one of those cultural things we'll throw out there to you. We'll be back after this. Don't go away. Radio's Daily Defense Studios. We've got one more segment. You ready to, to wrap this one up? I'm ready. I'm ready. You broke ground again. All right. So now you've got legislation in place. Thank God for that. And a judge today, and let's give this man his due, if I can pull this up. What was it's the judge? actually a woman. A woman judge. Well, okay, what is her name? I did not know that. What is her uh, her name is yeah. Judge Walker, right? Let's tell tell us about what she did. Yeah. Yeah. So um this is in Nashville, Tennessee. Judge Allegra Walker. Um she granted me the very first lifetime order of protection in the state of Tennessee. Um it just took effect July first and I was there last Friday in court and she granted that to me. Um, I was the sole witness to testify before the legislature in favor of the legislation. And it had true bipartisan support good. passed unanimously. Here That's good. That's so let me great to know. Yeah. So the lifetime order of protection, it can be issued to a victim of certain felony offenses to prohibit the convicted and that's, Keyword convicted offender from coming around or trying to communicate with their victim. So if you're a victim of felony offense of assault, criminal homicide, attempted homicide, kidnapping, or sexual offenses, you can file for a petition for a lifetime order of protection against that convicted offender. And then, um, of course, it's violated. That's a, basically a year in prison for each and every offense. Um, so you know what, if my stalker continues to write letters, it'll be about a year in prison for each and every letter. So he can be <laughs> spending a lot of time in prison. Um, now I will say this, I realize that this is only a piece of paper. Correct. I am not naive enough to believe that this man who has done these horrible things will follow this law. I'm not that naive. But what I will say is this, I think it's still important to have on record and God forbid a victim one day, because unfortunately these evil people are released back into society. You would think not, but they are every single day. Evil people like this are put back out there. And, you know, if a victim one day is forced to have to defend themselves, from the offender it's very good to have on record and i would you bet. think it would be a pretty solid defense you that bet way, it is. it's like look this lady did everything within the law to try and keep this person away from her mm -hmm. no one will be able to say she just simply did not try hard enough you know i i love this saying anymore you know the world is a is a box of nails and, and nikki goes there's the hammer i mean there you go I, and i look i'm gonna i'm gonna try to a couple things first off i would rather attend his public execution okay honestly uh, yeah, me too. believe me, me too. i know it i know it it's ridiculous but nonetheless and america needs to rethink that by the way the last public execution in america you want to make death penalty a deterrent bring him back Last public execution in this country, I believe, was 1936 in Owensboro, Kentucky. We haven't had one since. And uh, the nation needs to consider that, reconsider that, I believe, it's particularly when crime is the way it is right now and so many people's lives are being upended by this ridiculous violence. Uh, Nikki, I saved my best sponsor for last intentionally because on you tonight after this show, I am going to enjoy a Lead Slinger's whiskey in your honor for this. Because oh, that's fantastic. you have earned, you've earned it. The only thing is, I wish you were here to enjoy it with me, honestly, because I, I will do that. 30. And, uh, you know, you and I have been talking about this together. We've shared the stage 
about this together. And I am honored to be able to bring you to the microphone to let people know, because this is what real true advocacy is, is someone like you coming here and saying, I'm not going to take this anymore. And I'm going to fix this. And I have one last question for you. We're on the we're on the clock now, but one of our uh, one of our, our guests commenting wanted to know what kind of firearm do you carry? Well, I own 60. one, so it just depends on what I'm wearing and what I feel like. But I have several. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Semi auto and is it semi auto or is it revolver? I have both. There you go. That's all you needed to know. Nikki's got lots of guns, and she knows how to use them. <laughs> Nikki, God bless you for everything that, you know, for what you went through and for what you're doing to see to it that no one else has to go through this again. And, uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers are always with you and your family for having to, to go through this. As supporters of the right to bear arms, we thank you, and we all owe you a debt of gratitude we can never repay for what you've done. Nikki goes, so you can read the book, Stalked and Defenseless, How Gun Control Helped My Stalker Murder My Husband in Front of Me by Nikki Gozer. Go to Amazon, get the book, read it, and know that because you're part of the Armed American Radio family, you know her like we do. You can fight on her behalf as well. Enjoy the rest of your day. We took it right to the limit. We'll see you on the radio tomorrow. Thank you, Nikki.